name's Meredith. Um, normally I do uh, horrible, horrible things to application layer protocols. Um, this is my actually first ever like serious hardware project and also my first physical layer uh, playing with protocols project. Um, all right, so people have been playing with lasers to transmit data for a really long time. Um, that's essentially how uh, fiber optics work. Um, this is an article from an Australian electronics magazine from 1997 talking about um, doing uh, audio transmission uh, over laser. Um, basically, in this, uh, in this project, um, you've got an electric microphone which uh, modulates a laser which is received by a photodiode, um, and then that signal gets translated to the speaker. Um, so, yeah, that's all analog. Um, and if we can transmit analog data, then of course we can transmit digital data, which means we can send packets around. Cool. Um, so I said, hmm, well, you know, they're, they're absolutely right that um, you get an enormous amount of privacy if you're, if you're transmitting point to point uh, over optical, especially over a tight beam like a laser. Um, which you know not only is very difficult to intercept, um, it's also very targeted. You know, laser beams don't spread out very far, and if you, especially if you collimate them well, which I'm currently kind of not, but you know that'll that'll happen later on down the line. Um, all right, so um, we already have hardware uh, that handles uh, the physical layer of uh, digital uh, optical transmission. Um, You'll find those um, you, you, you find those uh, pretty much free in any broken DVD player that has uh, an optical audio jack. Um, this is a like two euro component um, that uh, has a ridiculously simple circuit to put together. Um, it's like one inductor, one capacitor, and you're done. Um, so that's the receiving end, and this uh, this module can receive at uh, 15 uh, up to 15 megabits per second. Um, so that's easily enough to handle 10 base T. Um, so I decided, all right, well, let's see if we can make a 10 base T Ethernet work. So. Um, the uh, hackerspace in London uh, makes these boards, uh, nanodes. They're basically an Arduino that uh, speaks Ethernet natively, um, has an ENC uh, 10 base T chip on it. Um, I'm not currently um, moving Ethernet packets around um, for reasons that I'll get to in just a minute. But the idea is uh, read data off of, uh, off of a Cat5 translate it into the format that is necessary to uh, uh, that, that the uh, that the uh, that the optical uh, or that the fiber optic receiver needs um, and, and will translate into uh, into bits reconstruct that into an ethernet frame and move it on down the down the cable on the other end um, Assuming you can aim it right, which it turns out to be, you know, kind of a <laughs> kind of a bitchy process. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna be playing with lenses uh, at some point later on down the line. My initial line of thinking was, well, hey, let's just get a Fresno lens, right? You know, because that's that's essentially a magnifier. Um, if, if if you've ever used uh, one of those sheet magnifiers uh, for maps. Um, looks like a bunch of concentric circles. Um, that's a that's a Fresno lens. Um, I looked for like small sort of credit card sized ones, um, but the one the only ones I found were sort of like hacked up into into smaller like smaller pieces, and that didn't end up working so well. So still on the hunt for decent lenses. Um, but what I've got set up here um, is. The prototype so far, um, receiving works, transmitting not so much. I'll explain. Oops, I'll explain why that is in a minute. Um, so this uh, this Arduino here uh, is the transmitter. It's driving a uh, it's driving a laser module, um, and then this uh, this nanode over here, um, which is not actually doing anything with uh, with Ethernet data, which is why it's not plugged in. Um, 
is the is the receiver. Um, you can't really see it through the uh, <laughs> through the through the the stand that we uh, hacked together with a Dremel tool and a cassette tape. <laughs> 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 that was Hans's idea. Make it good, eh? <laughs> it worked. It, it's it's not like the most stable, but you know it's it's good enough for now. Um, Maybe it's good to, to get the people closer to the audience. Yeah, if, it, it, if people want to come up and take a look, uh, go free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what this is, what this is supposed to be doing um, is the, the transmitter, um, and I'll, I'll pop this up on the, uh, on the screen for those who can see. <laughs> Alright, so this Protecting is... Protecting on junk. Alright. <laughs> so, what's supposed to be happening here is um, we're supposed to be uh, encoding, um, just iterating through, uh, through low ASCII characters. Um, padding them with uh, basically a, a sequence to show the start of the frame, then the character, um, then... <laughs> yeah. Alright, so... Start frame, character, and then uh, and then stop frame. This is literally supposed to be just sending one character at a time. Um, so it encodes. Uh, so this character encoded into biphase mark encoding uh, looks like that. So you go from uh, a car to a 16-bit int, um, and then if you also include the start stop frames, you basically got five ints. Uh, so what's biphase mark encoding, you might wonder? Um, also known as differential Manchester encoding. Yes. Um, okay. So this is kind of a this this is this is kind of scary looking, um, but it's it's really not so bad. Um, so the problem with um, normal uh, the, so the, so the problem with just sending data as high and low signals is it's uh, is you have to have a separate clock. Uh, keeping track of the rate at which data is coming in. Um, using differential Manchester encoding combines the clock signal and the data signal so that uh, it's essentially self-clocking. Um, so uh, the receiver that I'm using uses this second form where you've got, where you've got the clock before the data. So essentially, um, if it shifts during the, if, if it shifts during a two-bit sequence, it's a one. Then it shifts for the clock. It doesn't shift during that, so it's a zero. It shifts for the clock. It doesn't shift during that two-bit sequence, so it's a zero. It shifts during this one. It shifts during that one. Those are both ones, and so on and so forth. Still need a clock. No, the clock no. In it. Not no. a signal, but to time to, to get the timing. Internal the clock, you mean? Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, yeah. No. It's 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 on the, the it's it's self clocking on the receiving end. Is the is is the point I was is the, is the point I was getting at. All right. Um, so, what's it actually doing? Well. Um, let's get the uh, so we have actual like output going. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> you'll notice that um, it's not, uh, well, part of why it's coming in all zeros right now is because it's not lined up very well. I can try and fiddle with it if you want to see, like, actual data, but still what's going to come across is going to be a mess. Because, unfortunately, I kind of, so the initial rule that I set, my, that I set for myself when I started this project was I'm going to do this as dirt cheap as I possibly can. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, when, when you're dealing with a, you know, with, when, when your most expensive part is two euros, I mean, not, not counting the microcontroller, um, it, it's, it, it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, high-end fiber optic, uh, high-end high fiber optic gear costs, you know, thousands of euros. You know, this is the, this is the, this, you know, the, the high-end Cisco gear that uh, gets used to, you know, to drive, uh, like, undersea cables is ridiculously freaking expensive. And you know it should be because it can you know it can switch you know what Sonet is what like 622 megabits a second something like that, um, mm -hmm. yeah, um, you know so being able to do you know being able to do we're actually rate limited on uh, on this design um, by the by the speed of the of the Ethernet chip, not mm -hmm. the not so much the optical hardware. 
Um, but the problem I'm having right now, actually, is that I, I broke my let's do this as cheaply as possible rule and actually dropped, uh, <laughs> dropped some, you know, dropped about uh, 25 euros on, like, a, you know, what I thought, you know, a proper laser module would be, like, heat sunk and everything. <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out that uh, the, the, like, nice, fancy laser module also has a voltage regulation circuit in it that means that it can't switch at the, <laughs> it can't switch as fast as it needs to. So, had I just gotten like a five year old laser pointer um, and taken it apart and you know ripped the diode out, <laughs> I could have uh, I could have built my own uh, I could have built my own power switching circuit and you know problem solved. So that's going to be the next step is go find a cheap ass laser pointer and take it apart. <laughs> <laughs> Is it uh, also possible to do this uh, with just infrared uh, LEDs and just put it on light? Uh, yeah, but you wouldn't want to use infrared because um, the optical receiver uh, is uh, tuned to 650 nanometers, which is visible red. Okay. Um, there may be other parts that do infrared. Um, I, I'm not meaning about the laser, but just about uh, light. Yeah, um, no, you could totally, you could totally use a 650 nanometer LED. Um, so you'll get, you'll get it, a lot of interference, though. Well, that depends on that depends on how you do it. Um, so I've been uh, so I'm, I'm originally from Houston, Texas, um, and I'm still in touch with um, a lot of the folks at the hackerspace there, uh, Texrex. Um, and one of the guys there, Forrest Flanagan, is interested in working on the long-range backhaul side of, uh, of doing point-to-point -point optical. Um, so what he wants to do is use, like, giant, you know, like, you know, five-watt red LEDs, um, see, if we, see if he can find, you know, the hardware to switch 622 megabits a second. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know what the hell he's get, what the hell kind of uh, you know, what, what the hell kind of processor he's going to use for that. Um, but you know, he wants to um, mount it on top of the like uh, of the uh, of the grain silo, you know, the, the, the abandoned grain silo that he lives like a couple miles from, um, and then set up uh, one of these. Uh, a Herschel reflector telescope, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and just put, and just capture the visible light. That could be handy. Yeah. So we're gonna. But the basic technique is also usable in, in in this kind of situation. Right. Right. Um, because it's just a matter of you know can you switch the light? Uh, can, you, can you switch the light on and off that fast? Um, and he's been having a hell of a I'm time. Right, without without smearing it exactly, and he's been having a hell of a time finding parts that will work for that. Yeah. Um, he may have to go for just a higher wattage, uh, a higher wattage laser. Um, but that said, I mean, a reflector telescope is probably going to be uh, easier for uh, easier for focusing the damn thing. Um, they've got a uh, uh, they've got uh, vacuum forming equipment. Um, at Texrex, so he's going to be experimenting with making his own parabolic mirrors. Uh, nice. So, yeah, that's about it. This is, you know, this is my spare time hack. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Are you getting there? <laughs> now, I was thinking if you do it uh, in a visual way without lasers, you can use it indoors, for example. Mm -hmm. You put an uh, infrared uh, broadcasting device in your room. You can just broadcast digital data in live forms in a room. Yeah. Because yeah, I and mean, then the interference is low, is lower too. Yeah, and it'll still reflect off of mirrors. Um, the question is just whether the uh, um, the, the question is just whether the right kind of uh, uh, receivers are available. I know that with um, so like green lasers um, are not really uh, diodes. Per, they, they don't they don't really make green laser diodes when you. When you buy a green laser, um, you're usually getting um, a high infrared laser that's been pumped through a couple of crystals. Um, it cuts down the wattage significantly. Um, like I have a 167 milliwatt green laser um, that I don't think I can legally use in Europe. <laughs> uh, if I were to take the, uh, the filters off of it, um, it would be a 1.5 watt 
infrared laser. You can burn some uh, something. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Len <laughs> referred to it as the eyeball boiler. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when it's infrared. Exactly. Exactly. Don't look at laser with remaining eyes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Huh. Hey, uh, talk about Arduino. Um, if you want to do 10 megabits through the Arduino, is a processor uh, capable of doing it? Or is this only being used in this test situation you want to upgrade to a higher processor later? I want to upgrade to a higher processor later. Um, part of why I'm prototyping on the Arduino is that um, I want to start playing around with uh, Occam Pi. Um, if you go to uh, concurrency.cc, um, okay, so like way back in the 70s, uh, when people were experimenting a lot with parallel computing, um, a team in England uh, developed a uh, massively parallel CPU architecture called the Transputer. Um, and the language that they developed to run on that was called Occam. Um, and then like x86 really took off and nobody cared about massively parallel processing anymore until like now. <laughs> um, so in the meantime, Occam has continued to be developed. Um, they kind of glued the Pi calculus onto it and now it's called Occam Pi. Um, and they've, uh, they've also, uh, so concurrency.cc uh, has the uh, runs on an AVR version of Occam Pi. And so the Pi calculus is basically the lambda calculus for message passing. So if you're, if you're at all into functional programming, um, this is definitely something worth looking into because you're essentially, taught, you're essentially looking at like interrupt-free um, actor model uh, message passing. Um, so I'm, the one thing I'm a little worried about is, the, um, is like how many CPU cycles it actually takes to, uh, to, to take care of a message. Um, so there might be some slowdown based on that. But, um, what I'm hoping is that uh, not only can this end up being um, a, you know, a, an untappable way of transmitting data back and forth, um, I'm hoping we can also write it uh, in a language theoretically secure fashion um, and end up with an unexploitable protocol implementation as well. Mm -hmm. So, cross your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, do you plan to do anything about uh, signal integrity, uh, or do you just uh, let uh, Ethernet uh, take care of that? Because I think Ethernet has uh, checksums in the frame, some FCR checksum. Yeah, so. um, that largely depends on what field testing uh, comes up with. Um, I may end up like needing to come up with uh, sort of a layer between the file right. layer and the data link layer. Um, and if that happens, that's okay. There are lots of error correction. Mm -hmm. There are lots of error correcting codes out there. Mm -hmm. What's the distance you want to make with the laser? Well, so according to the uh, according to that initial article, you know, this this guy was saying that you know, with a parabolic reflector, um, you can get several kilometers of distance. Cool. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I, live in, I live in Brussels right now, like, really close to the canal, and I'm hoping to be able to get from, like, one side of the canal to the other. <laughs> you know, if I, can, if, I can, if, if I can ping, if I can ping across the canal, I'll consider this project a success. Um, but, and, you know, figuring out how to, there, there's, there's going to be some, you know, some, hard, some physical hardware-only hacking, like, figuring out how to, you know, how, how can I build a box that I can mount this stuff in and like have it and have it be adjustable in, in small increments? Um, and you know, we're also going to have to worry about environmental interference like rain and fog and stuff like that. Birds. Birds. <laughs> yeah, you know what happens if somebody like you know stands in the way? <laughs> I was uh, thinking also about your story about the um, telescope. Mm -hmm. What if we do, if we take a really big ass laser and we point it to the moon? <laughs> and on the other side we take, uh, we, we take a, a nice telescope which is taking, is going to look to, to the pixel on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> we, so we get moon bouncing. You, you know moon bouncing? Oh yes, oh yes, I do, I do the radio. radio. Waves, Laser. Yeah. Well, they, they do it with lasers as well. There are yeah, mirrors on the moon. Mirrors, but that's going to come right back at you, and you're not going to go anywhere with it. Right. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> it could be a nice extension. Of but the you know, if you can if you can see where the laser is hitting the moon, and 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 can focus That's in one on one hell of a laser. There's <laughs> <laughs> scorching rocks on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so this was this was Fisher's suggestion. I, don't, I actually don't know how much of a how how, how badass it is. Well, we have on one hundred one laser, and if an airplane comes in between, it lost its wing. You could project a movie on the moon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Time delay. <laughs> Maybe you should keep the camera right now. How many kilometers is it from there to the moon? I bet you're hitting a thousand. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's in like ten times geosynchronous orbit. I know that one, but I can't tell you. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that one off the top of my head either. And it's pretty hard because the atmosphere has got a light field deflection. So it would actually, uh, your light will scatter while it's going uh, out of the atmosphere. Good point, good point. And you know, also, and yeah, that, that, sort of, that sort of raises another issue too, which is that you know, once, you're, once you're shooting more than about 10 to 15 kilometers, uh, the curvature of the Earth starts to become an issue. Oh, <laughs> it's just a reason to like, have some satellites with lasers. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Firing my lasers. Yeah, but I mean, you know, people people already uh, with with well, telescopes, people already do automatic sure. tracking of um, of objects moving in the sky. Um, like I've I've gone to um, you know astronomy events where somebody uh, points a telescope at Saturn and then um, has software driving a couple of servos that move the the telescope at very very tiny increments. Um, to track the um, a, a clock here, right, right, um, and you know, for for, for micro adjustment, um, I think something like that's probably going to be necessary for this as well. Mm -hmm. you You're doing? Hmm? I'm tracking satellites that way. Oh, awesome! You're using uh, the base of a telescope. No, I'm using the base of a, a, a antenna assembly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, sweet. Yeah. Of a Two servos up. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it's a DC and an AC motor, mm -hmm. which are connected to uh, two pop meters, okay. which are used mm -hmm. to uh, to know where the, the assembly is. Mm -hmm. The whole station is run on, I think, about 250 rows of Python code. Oh, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's excluding the code which does the prediction of uh, the satellites itself. But right, yeah. That's that going to be rewritten because it leaks memory like hell. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't have everything first try. <laughs> <laughs> so you're pu pulling public ephemeris data and using that to... I'm using the, the standard Kepler sets which are available for all the satellites yeah, uh, yeah. in it's orbit. Ephemeris, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Using that to predict the uh, azimuth and elevation of all the uh, things I want to track. Yeah, I'd love to see that code when you're ready to have. Like, well, it's already online. Oh, I can right. give you the link, so no problem. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Any uh, questions? I'm using the lasers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the lasers. Yeah, lasers. All right, cool. Come here, lasers.